Hello everybody and welcome to tonight's workshop, Design Thinking with Scout. This workshop is brought to you by Pathfinder. Pathfinder is an extracurricular program for incoming first and second year students at Northeastern and we provide safe and inclusive space for students to discuss and pursue their passions. If you haven't already joined Pathfinder, then there will be a link for that on our website along with links to moderator applications if you're a third, fourth, or fifth year student who wants to participate. Um, and also on our website, you'll find some more information about the program. Awesome, thank you. Um, so for today's workshop, Delara and I will be presenting. I am the executive director of SCOUT and SCOUT is Northeastern student-led design organization. And we have a lot of different teams that do a lot of different things at SCOUT, um, ranging from design majors, majors to political science majors. Um, it's not just a design organization as some may think. Um, we definitely have a lot of different opportunities and we could talk a little bit about that towards the end. But for today's workshop, we're going to be focusing on design thinking, which is most relates to our Scout Labs team, which just Lara will talk a little bit more about. So hi, I'm Delara. I am the Labs Director, um, and I have been on Labs for three years now. Um, I am not a designer by any means. I'm actually an economics major with an urban studies minor. Um, but we use the design thinking process to uh, pretty much create a better Boston. Um, this semester, we are working on improving the community engagement process uh, over virtual platforms during the pandemic with the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, which is more of the civic research and design um, group of city, um, city of Boston. And last year, we worked on a pretty interesting project of connecting Boston Public School students to City Hall, which is the project featured throughout this presentation. So um, in line with the design thinking process, we will walk you through that project in particular. So this is the design thinking process. Um, it is a series of several steps that designers typically engage in to better understand their users, um, create prototypes that fit their users, test with their users. But the main focus is that at every point of the step, the user is involved somehow. Uh, even though these tiles are organized in a linear fashion, that does not necessarily mean this is a linear process. Um, you can spend weeks on the, on the define phase, but only a couple of days on ID8 so, and keep going back and forth. So by no means is this a li linear process, but it is an easier way to explain it. So the first step is notice. Um, in the notice phase in particular, we actually practice awareness of our identities, values, emotions, biases and assumptions. Um, I know those are a lot of words at once, but the main goal is to build an understanding of things that we may not understand. Um, so we can empathize with users better with humility and curiosity. So in practicing the notice phase, we have to follow these three um, steps. So we have to identify ourselves, identify our users, and identify our, our constraints. Um, so when considering the previous project, we identified ourselves as students at Northeastern. Our users are young students in Boston public schools. And our biggest constraint between ourselves and our users is that we have different backgrounds and experiences. And the next stage we're going to talk about is empathize. And the empathize phase is dedicated to understanding the experiences of others through different empathy methods within design thinking. And through understanding the users, we can learn about the needs and wants of the users and um, learn from them rather than assuming or coming in with your own biases. And that's why it's really important, the notice phase and how the empathize phase relates to it. And remembering that throughout the whole process, it's important to empathize rather than just in the beginning of the project. Um, so this is something that's really important. And 
as an example, last year during this project that we're using as an example, we went in to Boston Public High Schools and talked to students to put on workshops. And this was a way to really empathize and understand from the students themselves um, through active discussion and brainstorming and post-it noting. And it's really important to understand their wants and needs as the users of your design project. So the next step is the define phase, which I personally think is one of the more exciting phases. So during the define phase, we analyze and synthesize our observations. Um, there are many ways that we can go about doing that, which I will talk about next. But by doing this, we can define the problems that we have identified in the previous two steps and better understand how we can tackle it. So in doing so, we can then define a problem statement. Um, in defining this problem statement, we can take on a multitude of activities. Um, our personal favorites are usually generating a bunch of how might we's or a fun little reverse brainstorming activity. But there are so many that you can find um, resources for online um, on the web. So, for this project in particular, we decided to go with the how might we route and our problem statement was how might we help Boston Public School students have a meaningful experience with the city of Boston on an action civics project. And a large part of design research and design thinking is synthesizing your findings and one way to do that is through personas and personas are fictional characters representation representing users and this is a way of synthesizing the research that you've done and the discussions you've had whether it's surveys um, going into classrooms talking to the users and creating these fictional characters to help you understand users better and it's a way to empathize, engage the value of design through the user's perspective and thinking about how you can use these personas to um, work through other things, which we're about to talk about too. And something that relates heavily to personas are user journey maps. And journey, map, journey maps are a visualization of the process and emotions of users through an experience. So whether it's a current experience or you could use it to show the experience of a product you are making, um, you can kind of take the personas you create and bring them through a process and think about their emotions and what they're thinking about and what this journey looks like to this particular persona. So here's an example of our four different personas going through an experience. And as you can see from not even reading it and just looking at it, these four personas had a very different experience. Um, so you're seeing that um, we have these orange lines, which are their start date. So they were starting their projects at different times. This line is representing a mo emotion. So just thinking about how you can encapsulate all of the different research and the different people that you talk to and acknowledge the different users um, from your research through journey mapping. So the next step is the ideate um, stage. And in this stage, we really embody labs. It is the laboratory part of it. Um, but we focus on generating as many solutions we, as we possibly can to a given problem. Um, and we actually recently this semester uh, just started the ideating phase. And we did an activity called Crazy Eights where we just scramble and draw, sketch out eight ideas to a given problem. So it is truly a lab experience and probably everyone's most favorite stage. Um, but once we select the most meaningful solutions, we can then move on to the prototyping phase. So the next phase is prototyping. And this is when you take everything you've learned, all your user journey maps, your ideating session, thinking about your research from early, empathizing, sorry, um, 
and bringing it all together to create a prototype. And something that's really important during this stage is understanding that it might not be perfect and that's okay. Um, and like Delara was saying earlier about the crazy eights, um, ideate is really to get you ready for this prototyping phase to build a potential solution in addressing your problem statement from the de defined stage. And for this particular project, we ended up creating a website to connect students with City Hall employees. So something that's really important to note about the design thinking process is in the beginning, you don't know what you're building and you don't know what your prototype is going to be. Um, so you're kind of entering this project um, more on a discovery route and research oriented. And then when you get to ideation is when you start thinking about the solution of what your prototype will be, um, because it's really important that this prototype is driven by your research um, rather than going into it with the solution has to be a website or the solution has to be a mobile app but really having the research determine what your prototype is and the form that it takes. And the next step is the test step, um, which is kind of the final step. Um, the test phase is focused on getting specific feedback from our users and learning about improving the prototype we made in the previous step. Um, and it is important to acknowledge that feedback is a privilege. Um, we learned that this semester, given that everything is remote um, and fe soliciting feedback is a lot harder. Um, so we definitely try our best to take into account the feedback that we do get. Um, and it is important to acknowledge that prototypes are imperfect. We, our students, we are constantly learning. Our solutions may not be the end all be all, but through feedback, through the testing phase, we can truly try to provide something that is effective. And in relation to the project that we're talking about, um, we tried to include students in the testing phase. Um, so we actually went um, to a couple of classrooms and showed them our website and kind of walked them through asking them questions. And we actually felt that we actually learned that some of the language we used is not very accessible to a high school student, or some of the visuals you use doesn't necessarily resonate with them. So through that feedback, we understood that we don't necessarily see through a high school student's lens, at least not anymore. And we were able to take that feedback back to the drawing board and improve that in the student action portal. And the final step, even though it's not really a step, but is it is a step in this case, is the iterate stage. The iterate stage, like I said, the human-centered design process is not a linear process by any means. Um, so by at any point of this process, we can choose to iterate. So we feel that we did not um, go through the defined phase as much as we would have liked. We can definitely go back and build on personas, build on um, user journeys. So the entire process is an iterative process until we finally get to the solution that is the most effective for our users. So yeah, that is the complete process. Um, I know that was a lot, but that is pretty much what Scout Labs and many other designers do in a given semester. When you guys go through some projects and um, I guess I'm asking about your experiences with this, um, have you guys ever like gotten stuck or like weren't able to meet a specific deadline for um, one of the phases and how did you guys uh, kind of solve that issue? Yeah, I can, I can start. That is a great question and 100%. This is a very hard process to squeeze into a semester and the design thinking process could take years. I know there's organizations that use this for a very long-term project that ranges from like one to five years. It really depends on what it is. Um, and something I've learned is you could do research forever. And that's why it's helpful to remind yourself that you can go back to phases and it's okay if you didn't get as much research as you wanted to, but you want to start ideating and then maybe come back and realize that. Um, especially on Scout Labs, since we're constrained to one semester, um, we do find a lot of the time that we are, we wish we could go back, but then the following semester, um, 
in the past two years on Scout Labs, we have worked on the same project for two semesters and just kind of did the process um, two times and going through all these phases. So we were able to see the benefit of going back and doing more research and doing more ideating. Um, so I definitely just, from my own experience, I always think more time is better and more going into these phases and practicing and continuing to do the research um, will end up with a more, I don't wanna say better product, but a more understood solution. I think it's important to note that we also ask a lot of questions. Like we are not alone in this project at all. Um, Monum is a group of designers that have gone through this process for many years. Um, we have our labs alumni network. Uh, we have outside um, an outside network as well. So we do get stuck we thankfully have people that can help us kind of get out of that rut. But like Shannon said, it is very difficult to kind of jam pack the entire process into a semester, but we have managed to do that somehow uh, for two years now. <laughs> I had a question about getting involved with Scout Labs. And um, I'm really interested because Delara, you mentioned that you're an economics major. And I was curious what other majors um, participate in labs and how you can have the interdisciplinary experience there. Yeah, um, so I think only two people on our team this semester are actually design majors. Um, and one of them is a business and design, so like half design. But I like to say that labs uh, really benefits from having people that are not designers because they bring different perspectives so last year we had a mechanical engineering student that really was interested in learning to use Figma and learning to make tools to make the process, the community engagement process a bit better. I personally do not have that perspective, but he most definitely did. So it's interesting to see how everybody's different interests and skill sets come together to um, create Scout Labs. And that, that is a purposeful decision in the labs when we build the Scout Labs team um, to bring as many different perspectives as possible. I also had a question. Um, so being in like Scout or really any Mosaic org, it kind of puts you in a unique position because they are for the most part student run. Um, and Northeastern is really big on like experiential learning and experiential thinking. Um, so how has being in Scout helped you expand on your experiential learning? I love this question. Um, so I actually was on the labs team for two semesters prior to my current position. Um, and I came onto Scout Labs having no idea about this process and no idea about human centered design or how design could be interdisciplinary and not all about how things look pretty. Um, so I definitely think that Scout Labs has driven my career path. Um, I definitely want to work in design research and design thinking um, in my career. And also it just kind of opened me up to understand that it's, everything really does benefit from being interdisciplinary. You don't learn from being around people that think the same as you or are ex the same exact major as you. It's really important to cross paths with people that are very different because that's how you learn and that's also how you teach others. Um, and I just feel like um, being a part of Scout, I'm able to, even in my position now, um, I just am constantly learning from everyone in the community. And it's just a really valuable experience to constantly be learning from people that go on different co-ops or go abroad in different places or grew up somewhere else. Um, so I just feel like not just like I mean, of course, like the personal aspect too, um, but definitely just like working with people that think differently than you has been kind of my biggest takeaway from Scout Labs and Scout in general um, and how I want to, now I know I want to work on an interdisciplinary team after school. I would, say, I would also agree um, without Scout Labs, I would not have known my career path now. Um, I'm really interested in urban planning and I have been able to interact with the city of Boston all year. Um, I've been able to work with the um, work in the city of Boston as a co-op. 
So Scout Labs has definitely had an impact on my experience at Northeastern and possibly beyond. Um, other than that, I really truly think <laughs> that Scout Labs is the epitome of experiential learning. Um, you're kind of thrown into the unknown and forced to figure it out, but it's really exciting. I personally think it's the most interesting way to do research. Um, I really felt limited in my college um, with the research opportunities there and I wanted something truly experiential and I think Scout Labs has been able to provide that for me. So go Scout Labs. <laughs> Great. Um, and we just like to usually ask our hosts if they have a piece of advice for incoming students, incoming first and second years, um, since you both are student leaders within Mosaic and have been through many, many semesters of Northeastern. Jump out of your comfort zone and apply to positions that make you uncomfortable and go on teams that are different um, join clubs that are different. Um, I've been a part of so many different clubs just to learn different things. And I think I still uh, wish I've joined more for like a semester or two. Um, I just think it's great to try new things out and try different organizations and positions out and see. You'll always learn if you like it or you hate it. I would say do what you want. Um, I know that's very simple, but it's not as simple as you think it is. But um, I feel like if you even try not to do what you want, it will eventually come running back to you. Um, so if you are passionate about something, keep doing that thing. Um, you're obviously passionate about it for a reason. There's no reason to not do it. Um, so if it's your calling, just go out and do it. That's my two cents. <laughs> Will you guys be also accepting applications um, for next fall, so fall 2021, like if I were interested um, in applying? Yeah, definitely. We're going to be opening applications sometime in April, because um, once they open up, they'll be open for a few months for the fall, but interviews start to take place in July, so just something to keep your eye out for. Um, and ways to stay connected. Um, Although our applications aren't currently open for the current team, we do have weekly scout office hours every Monday, six to seven, and every Tuesday, five to six. And this is just an open time to come talk to scout members about portfolio, resume advice, career advice, classes, what scouts working on. So this is just kind of an open time to jump into a Zoom call and chat, um, very unstructured, definitely. I would recommend stopping by if you're interested. Um, then we have our speaker series that are bi-weekly on Thursdays. We actually have a speaker event this Thursday if you're interested. Um, and you can get all this information um, from our newsletter that goes out weekly. Um, and that's on our website. And we also have a lot of information on our website. Um, but kind of where the most information is, is our social media as we always have our events um, posted there and scout office hours. Um, so everything's basically NEU Scout, NEU Scouts our Instagram, YouTube is Scout, email scout at neu.edu, and then that's our website. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your time and we really enjoyed um, your workshop. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Pathfinder meets every week for roundtable discussions. We also meet weekly for workshops just like this one. So check out our Google Calendar and